Hello everybody, June here. Ever since I made that walking suit that I showed you some time ago, probably in, I want to say June now, it was the blue skirt and the striped uh, short waist. I have been in love with the silhouette of the 1890s, particularly with those skirts. They are wonderful. So when the New York Historical Costumer Society decided to have another Gilded Age themed get together uh, in October, it is now November, I'm recording this after Thanksgiving, um, I knew right then and there that I wanted to up the ante and make, instead of a walking outfit, make a whole walking suit. Now, I wasn't sure what the temperature would be doing at that time in October, because in New York City, you don't ever know whether in October it's going to be 80 degrees or, you know, 20. And so I wanted to hedge my bets a little bit and err on the side of it being slightly warmer. So instead of making the walking suit out of wool, I decided to make it out of cotton twill. And uh, this time I went for gray because I was taking inspiration, uh, at least in color scheme, from a fashion plate that I will put on the screen here for you to see. So I had decided that I would make a gray suit with a red uh, waist underneath and then a white um, cravat type sort of neck thingy. Um, not quite what the fashion plate has because the fashion plate has um, a bow. Uh, I didn't make a bow. I felt that a bow would just be a little bit too much for me, but at least for the color scheme, uh, that's what I was going for. And I don't actually have any footage of me making any of these parts because I was, as I tend to do, making this pretty late. Like I was up on a deadline and it's not that I enjoy making things on a tight deadline. It's just that I don't have a historical wardrobe, so for every event that I go to, I have to make the thing. And um, you always uh, um, overestimate how much time you have and underestimate how much time it actually takes to make things. Now, luckily, every time I've, I've done this to myself um, and tried to make something with a very tight deadline, I've managed it, but only just barely. Um, I don't have any footage of me making any of this, but I will try to show you some of the guts of the skirt because that's what matters the most. So for the skirt, uh, I use the same pattern that I used last time, but I did use a different construction method. The blue skirt from back in June, it has a slightly heavier uh, cotton twill, and so I didn't line it, but this twill that I bought for this um, suit was a little bit lighter, and I felt that for the skirt, at least, it needed more body. I did flatline the entire skirt with muslin. It's the same muslin fabric that I used to make my mock-ups. Uh, I did wash it um, ahead of time, and so I used that to flatline the entire skirt. And then for the hem, uh, I mentioned last time that I, I just used uh, horse, bra uh, horse hair braid, but this time I actually made a face aim uh, because I didn't, I didn't level out my hem afterwards because, and it, I didn't do it because it, the, the back um, gave it a little bit of a train, which I liked. So it was easier to draft um, the facing when I didn't actually do any adjustments after I got the fabric. So I just drafted the facing space on the pattern pieces that I already had. And so this turned out to look so nice. I like the heft of the fabric of the skirt. I like how it drapes. In the back, I again gathered instead of pleating because pleating is uh, like the bane of my existence. And I like the gathered look. It does, it, it is heavier than the blue skirt, uh, which means that the, the center back waist droops a little bit, which it tends to do on pretty much every 1890s walking skirt I have ever seen anyone made. The center back um, waistband dips a little. And I just don't think you can help it. There's so much weight back there and so much heft that it necessarily just pulls down on the waistband. It's not too much. I mean, it definitely doesn't drag on the floor. 
uh, but it, it's it's more present in this version of the skirt than in the previous one. After I made the skirt, I made the jacket. And I'm not gonna mention the name of the pattern line for reasons, but I'm pretty sure that you can probably guess um, what pattern this is. But um, I chose my size for this pattern based on the um, a very complicated set of instructions that the designer has on the pattern piece. And I think it fits pretty well. My only real fitting issue with this jacket was the sleeves. And they were just too long. And I wasn't sure how exactly to shorten them because they are curved sleeves and they were a little tricky. Eventually I did manage to shorten them and I shortened them two inches, which in retrospect is probably half an inch too much. Um, I should have just done it about an inch and a half. But the point is that curved sleeves are really difficult um, to figure out how to shorten just because just because of, of the way they're shaped. But uh, this is also made in the same cotton twill, but it is not flat lined. I did not flat line neither the body nor the sleeves of the jacket. Uh, it is lined, however, with silk, um, China silk. So very lightweight silk in as close a color to the twill as I could possibly get it. And um, I think it looks really great. The, uh, the gathering of the sleeve head is so dense that it just keeps the shape of the puff, poof? I don't know, the shape of the, of the sleeve cap at the top. They do deflate a little bit on the sides, but I think that's just the nature of these kind of sleeves, unless you have sleeve support in there, which quite frankly, I don't think they wore all the time. I think sleeve supports in the 1890s were probably more of, a, of an evening wear type thing. But anyway, uh, I made the skirt, I made the jacket, and I still had to figure out what I was gonna wear under this jacket. I ponder this the longest because I, I didn't want to wear sleeves under that jacket. So I knew right off the bat that whatever waist, whatever shirt waist or waist or whatever I was gonna make, it would have to be sleeveless. And I actually based this on a lot of research that I've done, both by looking at patterns from the time, uh, but also descriptions. And it appears that if you were wearing a jacket, um, a lot of the times the waist underneath, so the, sh the blouses underneath would be sleeveless. And this is great because it means you wouldn't have to wrestle your shirt waist or blouse sleeve inside an already big sleeve, which can add a lot of bulk. So I knew right off the bat, I wanted to be sleeveless. I couldn't find anything like that. And so I resorted to one of my uh, pattern drafting books, the ones that I discussed in the previous video, which I will link, is it here? I think it's here. I will link on a card on this side. And so I settled on a pattern from this book and the pattern is called, and I'm gonna put a better picture of this on the screen so that you can see it, but it's called the Lady Street Costume and it is a pattern for the entire thing. So the blouse, the jacket, the skirt, but I used only the blouse. And the blouse in the picture doesn't appear to have a center closing, which I know that it does in some way because in the pattern, um, it does have space for a pocket. So I don't know whether they have sort of uh, hooks and eyes closing that center front or maybe a hidden placket, although that is not reflected in the pattern. But uh, I decided, because I was, you know, up against the clock, I decided to just do a regular button placket and uh, on the front. So I drafted the whole thing based on a size 43 bust. And I will say that because it's, it was sleeveless to begin with, and it, because it was supposed to be blousey in the first place, it works. But um, the if, if this was a garment that was meant to have sleeves, the actual sleeves would have probably started down here because that's how wide the shoulder was. And I think, well, I know this is a function of the fact that you are using just one measurement, so your bust measurement, 
to draft an entire blouse. And so if you're busty like me, uh, those measurements will be skewed because you don't, you don't grow the same um, in the same proportion everywhere. So just because my size, my, my bust requires a size 43 measuring tape doesn't mean that my back does, doesn't mean that my arms do. So this is one of the problems with drafting from these apportioning systems that use one single measurement is that it will work well for say the size uh, 29 bust, which I think is a native one to the system I used. Uh, it may be four sizes above and four sizes below, but after that, it gets distorted quite a bit. So you'll have to make a muslin. I didn't make a muslin because it was gonna be sleeveless and it was gonna be on the jacket anyway, but this is something to keep in mind. So I drafted this blouse. Um, I did not add enough hem allowance because all of these draftings um, are without seam allowance. Uh, actually, that's not true. They do add seam allowance at the shoulder in other side seams, but that's it. But anyway, I didn't add enough uh, hem allowance and so without being hemmed, it was just as long as I wanted it to be. So what I did was just finish it with a uh, bias tape, uh, both in the hem and in the arm side. And this was very quick to make. And if I was to actually, as I said, as I said, make this with sleeves, I would probably tweak it a bit more. But for what I needed it to do, it was great because um, it would, like the sleeves came below my actual, um, my actual sleeve head of the jacket. So it gave me a little bit of coverage from the seam there. So those seams were not rubbing against my skin. So in the end it worked out great, but you know, buy it beware, I guess. If you're drafting from these systems and you have a large bust, you have to keep in mind that everything else will be distorted and will be larger than you need it. So making a muslin is kind of mandatory. And on the day of the event, I still didn't have the cravat. Um, it, it has a different name and now the name totally escapes. But anyway, the event was at one o'clock and I kid you not, I was sewing until 11 o'clock in the morning when I had to actually start getting ready. So I sewed it last minute. It doesn't look as nice as I wanted it to, uh, but I did the job and I did some insertion lace because if you're already running late, like why not just go for it and just be super ambitious. That should be, um, I don't know, my motto in life or something. Um, and so I put the last stitch on this whole thing, literally got dressed, did my hair, put on my hat and left. And let me tell you, I got so many compliments on this outfit, so many. Um, and I am so happy with how it looks and with how it turned out. Um, even though I don't love the cravat, um, I think that's one thing that I would have to redo. And um, oh, also I forgot to mention that for the shirt, the pattern um, does not, like there's no piece for the collar. So I just drafted a collar and it doesn't matter what shape it is because the neckline of the blouse gets gathered into the collar. So it could be a collar that fits you. It really doesn't matter. So anyway, uh, Going back to the compliments, so many compliments. Um, a lady, while we were getting coffee, a lingerie in the Upper East Side, looked at me and she said, you look so real. You look like you just stepped out of a photograph from the period. And it made my day. And I am so in love with this 1890s silhouette on me. Uh, under all of these clothes, I am of course wearing a shift or a chemise. I'm wearing a corset. I am wearing uh, split drawers because, um, believe me, you do not want to re wear regular underwear um, under your corset and all of those things because you have to go to the bathroom. You'll never be able to put them back on. And I am wearing a hip pad, uh, which I was also wearing with the last uh, walking outfit. And so the hip pad, I, I tried the whole thing without it and it looked fine, but that hip pad really like kicks it up several notches and so on the garments are kind of key for all of these historical costuming um endeavors and unfortunately i don't actually have a lot of video of the event itself uh because i was busy having fun we were having so much fun so we met up in central park uh and uh i forget how many of us there were maybe six or seven 
uh, we walked around, we got pictures of each other, and then we walked to the Upper East Side to La Jarea to have um, tea and sweets. We stood in a long line. It was, I don't know why the line was so long. Uh, and then we sat outside and um, La Jarea, I think, is actually... Um, uh, it was actually founded during the Gilded Age in France, and their look is very Gilded Age-y, so we fit right in with the exterior of La Jarea in the Upper East Side. And again, so many people coming up to us telling us how wonderful we looked. Uh, and that's not why I do this, but it's always great because it's a testament to my skill as uh, both a maker and as somebody wearing the clothes. Um, I know that historical accuracy is kind of impossible, um, just because I'm a 21st century person and with 21st century mannerisms uh, and whatnot. But I think with this outfit, I got so close and I really, really liked it. And I can't wait to make more 1890s stuff because I am obsessed. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you next time. Bye.